All right, morning again, folks. Uh, today, we're gonna look at this little Remington rifle. Uh, this is a Remington Model 14 slide action rifle. This particular one is chambered for 30 Remington. Uh, neat history on this little gun uh, is designed by one of the best American farms designers ever, probably second only to John Browning himself. And every time you invoke that name, John Browning is the clouds part and uh, you know, light shines down and all that. But uh, John Peterson worked for Remington and he was no slouch himself. He ended up going to work for the U.S. military after that. A uh, little bit of that story. In 1908, uh, Peterson and Crawford Loomis, another designer at Rivington, were working on a repeating firearm to compete with the Winchester 94 lever action rifle. They were losing market share for the deer hunters. They had the Model 8 semi-automatic rifle in line, which was a Browning design, a long recoil semi-automatic rifle, chambered for 30 Remington, 32 Remington, 35 Remington. Um, I'm not, I have to look and see, I'm not sure they made any of that model in 25 Remington they may have, but they designed this gun, uh, this slide action gun, and it uh, came out in 1912, is when the patents were done and in the book, and the gun was introduced in August of 1912. So it's a slide action gun originally chambered in the 25 Remington, 30 Remington, 32 Remington, and those cartridges are ballistically identical to what were existing Winchester uh, lever action rifle calibers, the 25-35 Winchester, the 30-30 Winchester, and the 32 Winchester Special. So these were rimless adaptations of those cartridges and loading data for the Winchester cartridges works for the Remington cartridges. Uh, the 35 Remington was not an initial offering in this rifle. It came uh, just a few years later. Uh, the good news if you have a Remington 14 in 35 Remington is that ammunition is still commercially loaded for that caliber. You have to hunt and scrounge for the, the 25, 30, and 32, although certain small loaders do load it and cases are, uh, unfired cases are available and in a pinch they can be made from their rimmed Winchester counterparts. So uh, all is not lost if you, if you don't have the 35, if you have one of these other calibers in the Remington 14. It's just a little bit more difficult. So let's talk about the rifle itself. The Remington 14, 22 inch round barrel. It's a slide action gun. This is your bolt lock release right here. This small button at the rear of the bolt. So pushing that in allows you to pull the bolt back and we can see that the rifle is clear. So um, if you notice when I slid the forearm back, the entire magazine tube came back with it. As far as I know, it's the only slide action repeater uh, that does that, period, regardless of, of which it is. So that's rather unique. And if you notice these spiral, uh, these spiral features here on the tube, the purpose for that, and this was a little forward thinking on Peterson's part, was so that when the rifle is loaded, and it's loaded through this gate here, when the rifle is loaded, the, the bullet point does not come up hard against the primer of the round in front of it in the magazine tube. So the thought being that during recoil, uh, potentially the point of, the, of a Spitzer bullet or a pointed bullet could detonate the primer of the cartridge in front of it and obviously cause big problems in the front of the rifle. Now, that being said, I don't think I've ever seen any factory loaded 30-30, 30 Remington, 35 Remington, any of that that had a pointed bullet from the factory. So uh, it was a bit of a moot point, I guess, but it did allow uh, for a little bit of, of extra ballistic advantage uh, for folks that were able to load sport, uh, Spitzer bullets in these rifles. So that said, uh, we have the 22 inch barrel. Notice we talked before when we talked about L.C. Smith and, and the reblued barrels. These guns were all rust blue. They were made from 1914 to 1934. So this particular model lasted 20 years and was replaced in line by the model 141. Uh, the 141 was uh, mechanically identical, different sights, different stock dimensions. It didn't have as much drop at the toe and the heel. So it was a little bit straighter, a little bit taller sight, but mechanically identical. Uh, there was also a model 14 and a half. The 14 and a half was the same rifle, scaled down slightly to accommodate the 3840 Winchester cartridge and the 4440 Winchester cartridge. So it was a direct 
a competitor, if you will, to the 1892 Winchester, which was their lever gun shooting those calibers at the time. So uh, 75,000 ish of these guns were made. Uh, the 141 came about and it lasted from 34 until about 1950. Uh, when Remington was not yet done with pump action rifle production, the model 760 Game Master came out at the time. Completely different rifle, box fed, uh, was able to handle higher pressure. So you see that gun in 270 Winchester, 30 06, 243, those kind of cartridges that were not adaptable to this rifle whatsoever. So uh, we talked about the rust blue, and when we think about the rust blue, this is original. This is the original finish on this gun. It obviously, you know, it's, uh, this particular rifle was made in 1914. So uh, we're 100 and what, 109 years old uh, with this gun. So uh, it does have some wear, but it's actually a, a decent specimen given the, uh, given the age. I haven't pulled this off yet, so I'm not sure what it looks like under here. There should be a hard composite butt plate, but uh, at some point we'll see. But it looks like it's been on there for a minute, so I'm, I don't know how, how uh, anxious I am to necessarily take that off. Uh, one thing that, that I would like to show on these guns, on the 14s and the 141s, Remington inset a case head into the side of the receiver uh, with the caliber designation on it, which was, uh, which was just a pretty cool feature. And they continued that uh, through the 141s, and you actually begin to see that again in, in, the, uh, in the 80s with the, uh, the Model 4 and the Model 6 semi-automatic and pump action rifles. They reinvented that or replaced that right here on those rifles. So the rust bluing, if you notice the difference, and we'll bring up another rifle here that is uh, hot blued. Oh. This rifle is uh, traditional, or traditional modern, that's probably a better word, modern hot salt bluing on this rifle. So if you notice, there's a significant color difference. This is more of a charcoal black. This is more of an ink black. That's probably the best way that I know how to describe it. Uh, but the finish application is different. Uh, rust bluing is several applications. The gun's allowed to rust and then boiled and then carded and then rusted and then boiled and carded until you get the right depth of finish. This is a single application in a heated tank of caustic salts that gives you this finish on this rifle. So. Uh, two different applications give you two different colors, two different uh, quality, I guess, if you want to say of the finish, but um, they're easily discernible between the two as to which is which. Now, the reason that becomes important is when you're evaluating one of these older rifles that's supposed to be hot blue or supposed to be rust blued and you see that hot blue finish and you just automatically assume the gun's been redone. Any collector value that it may have is probably out the window. So the other things we're gonna look at on this gun, we know the finish is original. We're pretty clear this old oil finish is original also. These guns were prone to crack at the forend. Uh, they're prone to crack at the base of the forend here, up through the wood, and then around these forend screws where the screws actually attach uh, to the action bark cell. So we don't have any, we don't have any cracks there. We've got one little tight crack up here at the front. It's probably not hurting anything. So we're probably okay with that. Uh, other than that, just a general overall appearance looking for rust. Another good way to determine if these guns are reblued is this little UMC logo right here on this lower tank is relatively lightly impressed from the factory. And there is virtually no way to polish that to reblue it without losing detail. So we look at them under magnification when we look at uh, markings. We look at uh, this marking particularly. We'll look at the serial number. We'll look at uh, pin holes or screw holes here. They should have sharp edges and not dished edges, which are all indications of polishing. This screw here, by the way, on the 14 is a takedown screw. Undoing this screw, backing it out, the stock and the trigger unit separates from the, uh, the barrel and receiver unit, much like the Remington Model 12 or 121 side action 22 rifles. So they're really nice rifles. Uh, the barrel, the barrel legend on this one, collectors recognize I think six or seven different issues of this gun with minor mechanical changes such as 
the, the uh, drill and tap for the Tang site came about in 1914, so this will be the first year that that happened. Then there's variations in this barrel marking here on top of the barrel. But if you remember the Remington Society of America, excellent articles in their journals about the Remington 14 rifle. I strongly suggest if you're interested in the older Remington stuff that you join that organization. Uh, it's excellent, a lot of good information there, even on Model 700s and 870s and 1100s and, and all those more modern Remingtons, but also these guys as well. So wealth of information there about it. So this again, Remington Model 14, second year gun made in 1914 in caliber 30 Remington. A little bit difficult to find ammunition for it, but not impossible. But it would be a slick little shooter. There's no reason it wouldn't shoot today. No reason it wouldn't be a great white-tailed deer cartridge today. Thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.